car crashes, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts with host David Lamb and the attorneys of Hollis Wright. Hello and welcome in to the attorneys. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Our topic of conversation, criminal law and DUI. So a really interesting topic. A great panel of experts to talk us through this. First, though, some ground rules all throughout the bottom of the screen. Throughout the show, you'll see ways you can join our conversation. It's always better whenever your questions are involved. And Hollis Wright makes available attorneys that are standing by live right now to speak with you. That number you'll see on your screen as well. So that's a free, off-air, and confidential conversation that is a yours for the taking. So take advantage of that. Leading our conversation is the managing partner yep. of Hollis Wright. Josh Wright, good to see you, my friend. You too. You know, David, this is a shining example of uh, there are areas of the law where our firm has very little knowledge about it, and we bring on experts in these circumstances to be able to uh, answer questions so that people that watch this show have the ability to have a broad array of topics covered, not right. just the personal injury side or the industrial accident side that we may handle. And criminal and DUI is something that impacts a significant portion of society that w we, we like to bring at least information for people to help protect themselves from either having those circumstances or if you found yourself in that spot, uh, how to protect yourself thereafter. Um, and so uh, John Lenton is on, he's been on the show before, is a, a great resource in this area um, and uh, is well known in this area as just an outstanding criminal lawyer that uh, handles DUI too. And uh, John, first of all, welcome. Glad you're on again. Appreciate it, Josh. It's, it's great to see you. It's good to see you too. It's good to be out. Yeah, how, well, how is your, yeah, and, uh, exactly. How is it's your, good to be anywhere. Yeah, right how now. is your practice going right now with uh, COVID? I'm sure there probably uh, more stuff going on than probably ever has it, in this area of the law. It's been busy, but yeah. you know, I mean, we're in a new dynamic and a new environment, so we're all sort of adapting to that right now. Yeah. But, you know, I'm I'm staying I'm staying busy. Unfortunately. Tell us a little bit about uh, your practice and kind of your, your your firm specialty sure. and what you do. Um, my firm is made up of uh, my law partner Wendell Sheffield and my partner Christopher Daniel uh, and our associate Anthony Bowling. We primarily do criminal defense work. We do some domestic. We do a little bit of personal injury, some other areas of the law, but primarily criminal defense in federal court, state court, and municipal courts across the state of Alabama. Let's talk a little bit about this because, um, you know, as COVID uh, has started um, kind of, if you will, subsiding just a little bit, um, the courts have slowly started opening back up. And what, what, what has your practice been like through this whole time frame? It's, it's dependent on what court you're in, what county you're in. Um, Jefferson County has not moved as fast as some of the other counties. Some of the other counties I call the Wild West because um, it seems like anything goes. I've been to courts where people aren't wearing masks. There is no social distancing. There is no... Um, barriers, mm -hmm. plastic barriers or plexiglass barriers between the court or otherwise. And then I've been to other courts where it, you're sitting eight feet apart with mm -hmm. masks and, and virtually no total social distancing. So the dynamics have changed across the state and it yeah. just depends a lot where what jurisdiction you are. And it is, is in the criminal realm, are you able to use technology like FaceTime and Zoom in order to do preliminary hearings? I mean, how, how, how is that handled? Uh, in, in your area? Well, we're doing Zoom conferences now for, at least here in Jefferson County and some of the other counties, basically on pretrial matters, things so. that are not generally involving witnesses or people being placed under oath. Uh, I've had several preliminary hearings in some rather high profile cases, but those have all been in person okay. with social distancing and with other protective measures to ensure the safety of everybody in the courtroom. So again, uh, Zoom is being used more often. But I, I do think as things hopefully get better, we'll start getting back to in person. But quite frankly, I'm not sure we're going to see a whole lot of jury trials anytime soon, yeah. mostly because people are afraid. And I don't blame them. If I was yeah. older and, and got a jury summons, I wouldn't know if I wanted to come to court at this point yeah. in time. Yeah, the, uh, you know, David, it's interesting. John makes a really good point. Um, these local jurisdictions, each county is trying to decide how best to handle the jury selection process. You can imagine that's kind of complicated. It's not as easy as just saying, hey, here are 12 people that are gonna be in this civil case. 
uh, or this criminal case, you know, you start with a much bigger panel, mm -hmm. um, and then you strike people down to that 12. Right. Um, so it's complicated. So each county is trying to figure out, um, and with training wheels right now, determine yeah. how best to sit juries so that we can have trials. Uh, and the hope is that we get ourselves back to kind of where we were, being able to allow the the civil and also the criminal process to, to operate the way it's supposed to. Yeah. Speaking of that, on the criminal and the civil, help us understand the difference in those two, a question we've got here. But what is the real difference between criminal law and civil law? Well, civil law, and leave that to Josh, but basically we're dealing with grievances between individuals such as someone suing another person let's say for a car accident or for a person suing a corporation perhaps for being injured for on the job or being injured when they go into uh, you know be a patron in a store they slip and fall those kind of things criminal law deals with offenses that are made criminal by statutory decisions of the legislature saying that certain conduct is a danger to not only an individual but the public as a whole, as a whole and therefore if you commit such an offense or you're charged with committing it you can be prosecuted and punished. In the civil realm um, we're talking about compensation for injury. Uh, in the criminal realm you're talking about loss of liberty, uh, loss of uh, you know, fines and potentially loss of your life depending on what you're charged with and convicted of. Talk a little bit, uh, John, if you can, about just in general terms. We can hit this after a break here in a bit, but um, what, what is the criminal pro uh, kind of procedure? Like what, what happens from the time of an arrest forward? What, is kind of, what are the stages you go through? Well, you know, we have two types of offenses. We have misdemeanors and felony offenses, mm -hmm. and then we have also what's called violations. But I'll tell you, if we can go from the felony aspect of it, if you're arrested, um, in Alabama, you generally will start off in what's called the district court level. And that is where you know, you're brought before a judge to determine whether or not you have an attorney or not. Once that's determined whether you can afford to hire one or one will be appointed to you, then you move forward in that, system, in that area, in the district court, through what's called a preliminary hearing. And that's where a judge is called upon to decide whether there's sufficient evidence to believe that a crime was committed and you committed it. It's called probable cause. And if a judge finds that based on evidence presented by the state, that case moves to what's called the grand jury, to consideration by a grand jury. And a grand jury is a group of people who decide the same thing almost as a district court judge. Is there sufficient evidence to indict somebody? And an indictment is a written accusation accusing you of a crime. And that accusation, that written, written accusation, the indictment moves you into what's called the circuit court level, which is the trial court level where cases are disposed of by either a trial by jury or a resolution or a dismissal of something of that nature. So that's the, the quick version of how that we travel through the system. I know we're getting ready to go to break. When we come back, I want to unwrap a couple of those stages a little bit because we do get a lot of questions related to this um, and hopefully we'll be able to provide some good information to those watching. That sounds good. We are stepping aside our first break of the evening. As we do so, I want to remind you Hollis Wright does a great job on social media. Um, just search Hollis Wright. You'll find them on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, everywhere. Great educational informational resource for you, uh, so uh, check them out there. Stay tuned. More of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm, and thank you for watching the attorneys. We hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple, to provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free and all fair. So if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury topics, call, email, or text us. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, or go to hollis-right.com and click on the Contact Us button. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us and watching The Attorney. If you need help after an accident, contact the team of attorneys at Hollis Wright. Our law firm proudly supports Alabama High School Athletics as well as the AL.com Hollis Wright Player of the Week. 
Be sure to vote every week in the AL.com Hollis Wright Player of the Week fan poll. Be sure to go vote this week for your favorite player. Welcome back in to the attorneys talking about criminal law and DUI tonight. Before we get back to the conversation, a reminder, you'll see at the bottom of your screen ways you can uh, join our conversation. We'd love to have you do so. Also, attorneys from Hollis Wright are standing by live. That a free, off-air, and confidential conversation is uh, yours. All you got to do is pick up the phone and give them a call or text. Josh? All right. So, uh, John, when we left, you had given us kind of a broad idea of uh, the criminal process in a felony. Um, Let's talk about this. When do you recommend, let's take them separately, let's take felony first. With a felony, do you have a recommendation at the time within which you should get an attorney involved? Well, my view of it is whenever you're contacted by law enforcement who wants to talk to you about something that you're not aware of or they come out of the blue and say, hey, we want to talk to you about this, before you start talking to law enforcement, you need to to have an attorney because yeah. without knowing what you're going to be questioned about or how you're going to be treated, uh, you can cause or end up having more problems than you'd be thinking that you could have handled it yourself. And yeah. quite frankly, I think as early in the process as possible, you should have an attorney. Okay. You, you can't wait around because the longer it takes to do it, the process is moving forward and you're not getting any advice or representation or having anybody to protect your interests. So the earlier the better. Let's, let's take misdemeanors um, or municipal ordinance violations. Uh, I get uh, run a stop sign or a speeding ticket. Are there certain things you can manage and handle yourself or do you think it's just a good idea generally because of um, the, the wealth of, of uh, uh, criminal lawyers out there to get someone involved? Well, you know, people like to think I can handle most of the things myself. I can handle a traffic ticket myself. If it's a parking ticket or whatever, you may be able to handle it without any issue. If it's a minor speeding ticket, you may want to go in there and pay the court costs, pay the fine. But you have to understand there's collateral consequences to everything. You know, the more speeding tickets you have that you plead guilty to, you can acquire points on your license and eventually potentially have your license suspended. Mm -hmm. There, you know, there are a whole lot of collateral consequences that can occur that if you have an attorney who can perhaps help you resolve that in a different way, more successfully, such as maybe a diversion program that keeps a ticket off of you, then you want to be able to have somebody to do that and to offer that advice and give you the guidance you need. Yeah. Let, let me ask you this question. Um, are you offended as a lawyer when someone asks you on the front end what the cost to generally defend them for that is? Like, for example, if it's a speeding ticket or a DUI, or is that just something common that you deal with? No, we, I, I think a person has a right to ask you, to, you know, what's your, your fees? I always tell people, I don't have a, a menu. It doesn't have a list. Everybody's case is different. Everybody's situation is different. Um, you know, when a lawyer has to travel out of, let's say, our offices are in Birmingham, if I'm asked to come to a, uh, such as Asheville or Pell City or yeah. Montgomery, then obviously it's going to probably cost more because of the travel involved. But everybody's case is different, and we try to work with clients to give them the best representation in a manner in which that they can financially afford to hire us. I yeah. hate to see anybody go without representation, especially in criminal work. Yeah, you know, and I think it's just important to be able to have those conversations with a lawyer. Um, you know, and as John just said, I mean, lawyers ought to be able to uh, mm -hmm. find a way uh, to fit your case and the circumstances that you're in with your income level to make sure that you're properly represented. Good, good point. Question yep. uh, we've got here, uh, if I am charged with a crime in the state of Alabama, is there a way to get it off my record? And that's called expungement. Okay. And expungement is, um, the legislature passed, I believe, in 2014, the expungement law, which allows people who have had either misdemeanors or nonviolent felony offenses to expunge their record, to basically have a charge taken off their record. However, to do that, you have to fall within certain criteria. Your case had to be either what's called null prost or dismissed. Uh, a grand jury had to either no bill or find not sufficient evidence to indict you. You had to be uh, acquitted at trial. And, and 
there are some time limits in regards to those things. But to under, the most important part and the calls I get generally about that are if, if I've been convicted or if I pled guilty, can I get it expunged? And no, you can't. And the other issue is, well, can I get anything expunged? And again, no, you can't. The legislature has created exceptions to expungement, which means even if you had a case dismissed, even if you were found not guilty by a jury, certain offenses cannot be expunged, which I think is, to me, is terrible. It, it, there should be expungement for everything that you've been acquitted for. You should have that right. And we're hoping that the legislature will change that because right now I think there's over 30 to 40 offenses that cannot be expunged hmm. even if you were acquitted. Even if the case was dismissed, the legislature has not allowed for those offenses to be expunged from your record. But you can have certain nonviolent felony offenses and misdemeanors expunged from your record. There's a process you have to go through. You absolutely need to have an attorney help you through that. Um, but it can be filed with the circuit court of whatever jurisdiction the offense uh, was in, and then the court can expunge that record and basically take it off your record for um, you know, for the public vision, public won't be able to see it from that point. Let, let's uh, move topics just a little bit sure. to DUI because okay. I, I know it's something you deal with. Um, what? Let's just talk general terms. What's the status of DUI today? I know, you know, 15 years ago, people that had a first time DUI, a lot of times those were able to be pled down. You know, are they still able to be pled down? Does it depend on the jurisdiction you're in? Kind of what, what's the general status now of, of DUI in Alabama? I think Alabama is probably one of the most stringent DUI laws in the country. We, we truly do. We have, you know, five or six different ways you can be charged with DUI, um, the ability to have a uh, less, to resolve that case for something less than DUI has become more difficult. Uh, we have the interlock system now that has to be placed on your car, on convictions. Uh, you know, the fines are much heavier. You know, you have issues, collateral issues with insurance and otherwise. So I, I think we've, it's gotten even more difficult to represent folks in DUIs now. The one thing that's been helpful is diversion programs for first time offenders. Many municipalities, even um, counties, some counties have diversion if it's a first time offense and that your blood alcohol level was under a certain let, you know, was under a certain amount that you can be allowed to go into that diversion program and hopefully be able to get that DUI dismissed at some point in time. But quite frankly, it's become much more difficult in Alabama because people also assume that, that because you have a DUI, you can get some sort of temporary license or work license mm -hmm. to be able to drive to work. You don't get that. We don't have that in Alabama. Mm -hmm. We don't have temporary licenses. If your license is suspended on the front end, it's suspended. And, and if you drive and are charged or picked up on a new offense, then and while driving while your license was suspended, you've added even longer to that suspension. Yeah. So, it's become much more difficult. I think. What, what have you seen um, with Lyft and Uber? Uh, what's happened to the DUI business? Has it gone down at all, or or not at all? It just depends. You know, I mean, I think Lyft and Uber obviously is extremely helpful for folks. That, and I would tell anybody that if you're out having a good time and you're going to drink, then you really need to be thinking about taking an Uber or Lyft. Uh, and that may be against my own financial interests, but the reality is you know, that keeps you alive and keeps somebody else alive because, yeah. you know, if you're in, if you drink and you get involved in a car wreck or an accident and somebody's hurt or you're hurt, then we're not talking about DUI anymore. We're talking about assault or we're talking about if somebody dies, manslaughter, yeah. criminally negligent yeah. homicide, murder. So it becomes much more difficult. So I think Uber and Lyft has helped, but I mean, you know, people are going to do what they want to do. Yeah. Um, so uh, I do think that if a person's out there and they've been drinking, Look, get somebody to take you home, get an Uber, get a Lyft. Yeah. I know we're getting ready to go to break. We'll, we'll talk about some other things on the other side, though. All right. Uh, we're taking our final break of the night. If you want to join our conversation, you got a few minutes to do so. Stay tuned. The final segment of The Attorney is coming right up. I'm attorney Bobby Bell with Hollis Wright Law Firm. In today's world, social media is all around us. It is common for many people to post on social media regarding their life and activities on a daily basis. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and similar social media are a great way to stay connected to others and to share your experiences and thoughts. 
Some seemingly innocent social media posts, however, can have devastating effects if you're involved in litigation, especially in a personal injury claim, a contested divorce, or a child custody battle. Courts regularly allow adverse parties access to the other side's social media accounts, allowing relevant posts to be presented as evidence. These rules have allowed social media to become a hotbed of information in the litigation world. In fact, we are seeing more and more preservation orders issued by courts requiring you to collect and save any and all social media activity. Therefore, it's advisable that even before there's litigation, lawyers should advise their clients that social media content may be discoverable. Here are a few helpful tips. One, do not post anything about the case. This includes posts regarding conversations or meetings with your attorneys, remarks about your injuries, negative remarks about the opposing party. Do not post anything you would not want read in open court to either a judge or a jury. Two, avoid new friend requests from people you do not know. Many law firms and insurance offices may attempt to have employees follow you on social media in an attempt to gain information. Three, limit adding new photos, check-ins, photo tagging, etc. Seemingly innocent posts may be used against you. Regular check-ins at restaurants, parties, or other events with friends can cast doubt on any claims of loss of enjoyment of life, pain and suffering, or emotional distress since you appear to be living life as usual. Four, increase your privacy settings. Many social media sites frequently update and change their privacy settings. In the litigation context, it is possible you may have to preserve and present anything you posted. Therefore, we encourage you to be smart and careful when using social media. Please remember your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Thanks for watching The Attorneys on WBTM 13. Welcome back into the attorneys. About five and a half minutes remaining in the show. So if you want to uh, join the conversation or speak with those attorneys standing by, about five and a half minutes uh, to do so. A uh, question we've got here. If I'm charged with a crime. No, let me ask you this one. Uh, when an individual is approached by a police officer, are they required to answer questions posed by the officer? And what if the officer asks for consent to search a car or house? Okay. The long and short of it is, is if a police officer in Alabama has reasonable cause to believe that you have committed some offense or about to commit some offense, they can ask for your name and you know where you some basic biographical information. But if you're just on the street and having talking with some friends or walking down the street, and a police officer approaches you and wants to and just starts asking you questions, you're under no obligation to provide them anything of that nature. You can the thing I tell my clients or I tell people is if the police officer starts to question you and you're concerned about it, you, the first thing you need to ask is am I being detained? Because if you're not being detained, you can just walk away. And you know, people just feel so many times that, that when they get intimidated, and they do. And the authority the, the showing of authority is enough to intimidate, but you're not required to do that. Nor are you required to a police officer say, hey, can I look in your car? You could say, hey, no, you can't. You know, you know, because you don't have to surrender your right to search and seizure because you're asked to. And yeah. I tell people that that if you don't feel comfortable in a situation, walk away from the situation or ask them. And one of the things that we're doing now, and you're seeing a lot more of, is people tape recording their yeah. those things. And yeah. I think that's important to do because if you feel intimidated, you need to be able to tape what's going on so you'll have some independent proof of what actually happened during that that interaction with the police. How about uh, field sobriety tests? Are you required in Alabama to provide a field sobriety test? No, you can say no to a field sobriety test. You can say no to a breathalyzer test. However, there is a consequence to that. You know, um, under the applied consent law, you know, everybody has supposedly given their, their permission to, be, to consent to taking mm -hmm. that. But you can say no to it. Uh, and there's a lot of different reasons people do say no to it. If you have trouble breathing, if you have asthma, if you have a whole lot of different medical conditions that will not allow you to blow as hard as you can, you can tell the police that, but you have a right to refuse it. But understand if you do refuse it, your license can be suspended for that refusal. Yeah, and how, how long generally can your license be suspended? I mean, is it 
90, 120 days. Yeah, you're looking, you know, if memory serves us, we're at 90 days for that suspense, okay. suspension. But, you know, I mean, the reality is you can, you can attack that, too. You can file, the lawyers can file lawsuits to try to suspend the suspension yeah. until the criminal case is worked out. Okay. But that requires, a, you know, that's, that's dealing with the civil process and the criminal process yeah. all at the same time. And I know the um, the DUI penalties have increased over the years. Uh, has it gotten pretty significant even for DUI 1 and 2? It has. I mean, you know, you have you have not only a the financial fines involved, the suspension of the license, the requirements of going through certain community referral uh, treatment, and now we have the interlock, uh, which is applied, you know, is now placed on your car that you can't yeah. drive without doing that. So yeah, and, and remember the penalties go up yeah. for every conviction, so. Let, I, before we get to a final thought, mm -hmm. I just want to ask one more question, because I, I know th th this is a question we've had before. Um, when an officer pulls you over and runs your plate and has general information about who the person is in the car, what criminal information do you think they probably would have access to at that point? It depends. If they run a light, you know, if they've run through your name and your, if they get your name and your date of birth, mm -hmm. then they can run through what's called the NCIC program and try to determine whether or not you have any outstanding cases or okay. anything else. So, yeah, I mean, depending on how in depth they go when they pull you over and get your information. Uh, they can find out a lot about you just from being able to run through those programs. Interesting. Just about out of time, a minute, about a minute left, but a uh, final thought from the both of you, and John, if you would, you go first, please. Uh, well, I think, you know, and I appreciate being here. I really do. This is my, I don't know how many times coming here and, and getting to talk, but I, I do think if people have any issue in regards to being talked to by the police, their family, their friends, or whatever, and you have concern about being charged or the potential of being charged, or you have been charged, don't try to handle it yourself. Get a lawyer. Look for someone who has the experience and the passion and really um, is there for you. That's good advice. We, we don't have a lot of time. You've only got about 15 seconds to answer this question. Sure. Why do you teach? You've been teaching for a long time. Why do you teach at law schools? I teach at law schools because I like to see lawyers who are ready not only academically but technically ready to, to become lawyers and try cases as, when they, as soon as they get out of law school. Why we bring John on the show yeah. is because of that experience that he has. Yeah. And I think it makes him a more well-rounded uh, criminal yeah. defense lawyer, yeah. not just in the litigation sense of the criminal stuff, but also on the teaching side. Thanks for yeah. being on the show. Thanks, really John. appreciate it. Thanks, thank man. you guys for being here, and thank you for joining us as well. We always appreciate it, and we'll look for you next time right here on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.